How did the Voltron fandom become so toxic? Some people argue it's because they played the telephone game, but some of the things that some people said in that game ended up being just a lie. So when fans came in with bad info being promised queer relationships and transgender representation, and they got none of that, they did what they do and start filling in the gaps, assuming it to be true. Representation is important because if you go long enough without representation, you start making up your own out of spite and making up making your fandom toxic. If it didn't blow up into the epically disastrous proportions that it became, it would have been funny. I saw so many like epic breakdowns about how insert character here is technically queer coded and it's just like a whole essay and it was really well written and honestly very convincing but I didn't think they actually believed that they were actually queer or intended to be queer coded. I don't think the person writing it thought that either. And I think that's really where people started having an issue. People in the LGBT wanted to do an analysis through a queer eye uh, because that's what they relate to. And then there's some people who took these analyses and didn't realize that you weren't supposed to take them at face value and then they started doing it with like every show thinking that they could Sherlock Holmes their way into making every character gay. And then you have those people jumping into the shipping wars and that's when it all capsized. Force installing queer representation is fine in fun little fandoms, but not if it's being forced down the rest of the fandom's throat. But shippers shove things down everyone's throats. You essentially created a recipe for disaster. Everyone knows it was the shippers that really made this fandom toxic. But people miss the other elements that made this uniquely awful. It just created a recipe for disaster. Even for me, I wanted Pidge to be transgender representation. I watched the show just a couple of years before I even came out. But I knew the show made it obvious that she wasn't. That doesn't mean you can't appreciate Pidge willingly throwing away their gender in order to uh, pursue their goals, that's still very empowering to transgender and non-binary people. When Keith tells Shiro that he loves him, it's not wrong to think that maybe, just for a second, Keith was being vulnerable with Shiro, and maybe telling him how he truly feels. So long as you don't forget that literally right after that, or right before that, either way, he says, I love you, you're like a brother to me. And you just don't throw that away like the fandom did. The fandom was willing to throw away context. And I think the worst part of it is that the fan, people in the fandom took the words of the cast to heart. They took it as gospel. The cast of the show does not write the show. They don't know the long-term plans of the show. They aren't aware if things may need to change for the show. You do not ask voice actors about the story. You ask the writers about the story. You ask the directors and the producers about the story. The voice actors are there to understand the character. They are not there to make the character. And this has been a problem forever. You have fans of Star Trek asking, I think maybe Patrick Stewart or someone about the direction of the show and uh, some people, some fans would even like give suggestions about what they feel the story, what direction the story should go in. And the, and the actors needing to politely tell them um, that isn't their job. So in the end, you had shippers being shippers. You had vulnerable young people desperate for queer representation and also those vulnerable people being lied to and basically everyone not understanding how making a show works. Of course, I could be wrong. If there's anything I missed, tell me in the comments below. But let's actually finish up Voltron. The sheath shippers are the weirdest, if I'm gonna be frank, since it's obvious that Keith sees Shiro as a father figure, and this would be sort of grooming if they actually ended up together, and the show makes that very clear. This flashback not only shows how great Shiro is, but really makes me love his character more. That's what I've been saying. You're not better. Yes, I am. 
Season seven is where we learn that Shiro had a lover named Adam, something that wasn't really hinted at whatsoever, which you could argue you don't need to hint at it because it should just be treated as another relationship. Straight relationships don't need to be hinted at. Five years have passed since the release of this episode, and so I'm going to try and look at it from today's perspective to see if it's still as bad as how it was perceived back then. As they travel back to Earth, we get to see them deal with the unique problem of them no longer being able to recharge their lions, and their lions don't have the power for, to form Voltron, which means they won't get to use that recycle animation every episode. The Lotor lackeys are still kicking, and they're afraid of Lotor finding them and enacting vengeance. Also, these two are gay as well, and now that feels a little out of left field. <laughs> Also the conventionally attractive one, Aksha, is back as well, and now she's on their side, I guess. The last time we saw you, that was three decafebs ago. Not only that, but the Blades of Marmora were hunted to extinction. Hagar's druids killed them off. A lot has happened in three years. Oops, it was a trap. Now they're stuck, except Keith, because he didn't get all that much screen time in the previous season, so we're making up for it now. Kulavan is still alive, so that's cool. Also, apparently Hagar has quote-unquote forsaken the druids. Not sure why, though. Maybe she's upset that her son is dead. Alora's space magic saves the day again. I'm getting the feeling the writers had absolutely no idea what it really meant when Alora unlocked her third eye. And now they're all they're not only now getting around to exploring what she can do. The Altaian colony. Were you able to find it? I said to team. There was nothing there. The Altaians are extinct again? Man, not every day you can say something went extinct twice. So Keith's mom is gonna go and rebuild the blades. She's out of the picture. They didn't even bother with trying to build her character. She was just there to fill in Keith's past. Beyond that, she didn't really serve a purpose. That's disappointing. Also, if you made it to this video, the third video in the Voltron deep dive that I've been doing, comment below, I can't believe all the paladins died. To confuse everyone who comments before they watch a video. <laughs> When the consensus of the internet said that season seven is when the show gets bad, I see it now. I have my own qualms about season six, but oh my gosh, season seven is boring. They're lost in space and not in the Danger Danger Will Robinson way. It's just slow and boring. They sit around doing nothing but talk about what they need to do. They talk a lot about how they're bored and that's boring. I like the idea of that struggle, but you don't show it. You usually glaze over it and tell the audience that they went through that struggle and get to the good stuff. Everyone can agree, this sucks. They have the most boring episode of them all floating through space for 20 minutes, going insane, only for them to recharge their lions after they realize the power of teamwork. That's dumb. I swear there could have been a better way to do it that didn't require 20 minutes of them bickering and nothing happening. Then they use Keith's super cool light speed wing powers to beeline them straight to Earth's solar system. Turns out Earth was conquered by the Galra because of course they were. If I was running a gal galactic empire, I would do that too. The paladins got so boring, we did a two-part flashback to four years ago showing when the Galra invaded Earth. And don't get me wrong, this was cool and engaging, but oh my gosh, this is really disheartening for the show. We know all their efforts fail. The Galra win, so what's the point of having this? I've read online some people arguing that the reason the writing went downhill is because of the writing being jumped around to different writers, which I would push against because contracting multiple writers is and has been the norm for a long time. I mean, I could go on about how much of a problem contracting writers instead of employing writers is creating greater problems in the industry, but that's for another video. Point is, I don't think that's the actual reason why the writing started going downhill. Wait, wait, what? Adam is dead? I didn't even realize who that was when I first watched this season years ago. I completely forgot about Adam. They did nothing with him. I am torn. On the one hand, wow, of course the gay character died. On the other hand, wow, of course you iced the main character's love interest to progress their story. And on the other, other hand, it's not all that bad. I mean, we saw this trope was probably gonna play out. 
And hey, we're treating LGBT characters the same as any other. Someone needed to be iced for the main character's in progression. Not even the gays get special treatment. <laughs> we discriminate equally here. This is a lose-lose situation, and this was handled very poorly. Um, <clears throat> I'm very aware that this was bad. I think the thing that really made people upset isn't that Adam died. I think it's just the fact that they, um, dropped that Shiro had a queer love interest and then did nothing with that. Literally nothing. Like, cool, here's your representation. It's only slightly better than, hey, Dumbledore was gay. But not really. I think that's, they shoehorned it in and didn't really think about it. We finally get to see some rounding out of Hunk's character. Seven seasons in. But I realized that nothing, nothing would have been greater than seeing my family. Operation on Shiro's arm doesn't go well, but Allura gives him the cool crystal from her tiara, and now Shiro has a floaty arm thingy, so that was nice of her. Thankfully, we do a hard detour back to what made this show engaging. Rebel groups fighting insurmountable odds, taking small victories at a time, small footing forward until they make indisputable progress, small teams of elite fighters that are especially equipped for the job. That's what I've been missing from this show. The actual teamwork, not just the, we're a team guys, let's screen together and make a big robot, but rather showing us that they can actually carry out a mission as a unified unit, multiple people acting as one, the tense setting and more intense coordination needed for these sorts of scenarios. That's what I love from these shows. And I know that's very difficult to do, but it's the most satisfying. Turns out there's like six super powerful planet destroying cannons that are building on Earth. Speaking of things that were dropped on us without much fleshing out, they're digging into Allura and Lance being a thing, which we haven't seen any real chemistry between them. It's awkward and it feels wrong. Heck, Lotor and her had more chemistry than Lance and, Lo and, her and Allura. Lance and Keith had more chemistry than Lance and Allura. No, no, they did. Uh, wait. Oh, hang on. Wait, you're right. Oh, but that doesn't make you, y you know, r right. Everything goes wrong when trying to destroy all six cannons because the mean admiral person betrayed them, fully convinced they can't win and switch sides. So they just have Voltron take the full attack of those six cannons and dang, magic spakes rocks are strong because they're not destroyed. Don't worry, Shiro, there's still another season. Here's the real reason the story went downhill at season seven. The problem is that there's not one figurehead antagonist. There's just a war. And even though a war against an empire can make for a good story, it's missing pieces of what makes a story a story. The antagonist is large and nebulous now. We need more direction as an audience. The two figurehead antagonists are dead. Now we're just wrapping up loose ends and it just can't be as engaging as it once was. I mean, sure, you have Sendak and I guess that he's the new antagonist, but we all know the real antagonist is just the Empire. We get a new HQ ship to replace the one Allura had, this time with human tech. And it's got its own Star Destroyer destroy your cannon, so now we can conveniently and miraculously tip the scales. The secret weapons the humans have been working on will be humanity's savior. It's gonna be tight! The big battle between humanity and Sendak was so drawn out, I was bored. Sure, it was an e it was epic on paper. They changed up the game often enough to keep it all as engaging as they could. But when they brought back Voltron, I felt like that should reasonably be when they started getting the upper hand. There's been like four or five twists during this whole battle. At a certain point, I just want them to win. I guess it makes sense they want to have Shiro really be a part of the mission, but they didn't have to drag out this battle. They beat Sendak, a victory I wish felt more epic, but the stakes were wrong in this fight. Sure, you have humanity, but again, that's nebulous, not personal. I mean, heck, this battle should have been spearheaded by Hunk since he was trying to save his family. That's personal. But Hunk isn't the popular character. And then they just randomly add some robot that 
They literally just drop on us. They just felt like there should be a robot fight. There was no build up, no foreshadowing. Just, okay, here's your robot fight. This battle has overstayed its welcome and wasn't focused on the right characters. The bad robot sucks out Voltron's power and destroys the Atlas special HQ ship. So all that fighting we suffered through for, what, four episodes? All of that was for nothing, and then Shiro pulls out some weird BS where he connects with that super cool crystal they're using to power the ship, and it, I don't know, morphs the ship into a new robot? Even though it wasn't designed to do that, now we're starting to just change the rules of space magic to do whatever we want. We're deviating so far away from what we established at the beginning of the show that it's no longer even the same show. Just throw stuff at the wall. So long as it's cool, we're good. That's all they're going with. We don't care if it's good writing. Focus on making more robots to sell more toys. And that's how they win. Crystal magic that can just do whatever they want it to do, which means now there's technically a super robot that's arguably more powerful than Voltron by technicality, and now we're undermining the importance of Voltron. This is just wrong. All of it is wrong. I'd prefer it if they had to find a way to upgrade Voltron, not this. Heck, there's two robots that are arguably more powerful than Voltron. They win by hitting the weak spot, and that's it. No special tactics. Just, hey, see that big opening? That big target on its chest? We should hit that. You had a solid premise for a fight between Voltron and that robot, and it was reduced to simple video game logic. Yay, happy ending. Now we start rebuilding Earth with all the alien races banded together as one. Honestly, not the worst ending in concept, but Oh wait, they studied that mysterious robot and there was an Altaian inside? That was insulting. I was bored. I was wondering what they were going to do with the whole Altaian civilization that Lotor set away. I know Keith sent some, I think the Blades of Marmora to go find them and then they couldn't. So I guess we're getting the answer to this. But did they really need to add that on top of an already drawn out battle? I don't care about Sendak. They never fleshed him out. He's a mini boss. He's not a boss boss. He did not carry the weight that Lotor or Zarkon did. I would have had more fun playing Star Wars Squadrons than watching this show. Not that I'd actually play that game since I'm not giving EA my money. And the worst part is we're not done. They managed to make it home to earth. They had multiple opportunities to properly end the series and they just don't. We have one more season. We're going to see how this ends, but oh gosh, I'm dreading it. Thank goodness we take a hard break from the super duper serious tone of war and battle and grizzliness. We focus on Lance asking out Alora on a date. I needed this. The balance of silly and serious has been thrown way out of whack of the show after season four. Apparently the person that took the Altaians was Hagar, and now she's basically gotten herself a dedicated cult that's carrying out the lies Lotor told them. I'm glad to see she's back, you know, an actual villain. Sendak now feels like a side quest that took way too long. Hagar is the villain I wish we got to faster. Alora talks about how when the war is over, everyone has family to go home to except her. And it's hard not to feel for her. And now I actually wish she ends up with Lance just so she has a family. Yay, they kiss. Ooh, they kiss. Hagar finds out her son is dead. And now we get proper personal motivation for her to be a good villain. This is what I'm talking about. Now it's interesting. Oh my gosh, she's a space she's a she's a space witch and she's named Hagar. Like Hag, another name for a witch. I cannot believe I never saw that until right now. <laughs> Hagar, or I, I I guess I should say her true name, Anerva, decides that the Galra way is wrong and the Empire is weak. So she's just wiping the slate clean, sick of the Empire and taking control. Now this 
This is good. I like this. Breaking tradition. Sorry, another tangent. How did Lotor get a pseudo-European accent when literally no one else has that accent in his family? His mom didn't and his dad didn't. Is it like genetic with some Altaians? Anerva tells the new Altaians, hey, Voltron killed your messiah. Fight with me and get revenge on Voltron. And they're like, Hey, that sounds good. Sounds like Voltron sucks. We basically have a whole new war. I mean, sorta, but not really. Same empire, different motive. They're literally decimating planets with their super special cool robots. Even that super advanced planet where a Pidge learned to make trees. Okay, so this is weird. So bear with me. Pidge developed the same connection to the land as this alien race. And she's basically Assassin's Creed's this place in order to see what happened. And they discovered these super robots can fold space time, which is why they circumvent scanners. Essentially, they just wormhole their way wherever they want, which they make it sound like that's a big deal. And I guess it is. Lotor's ship needed the Voltron crystal to do that. These things got Altaian magic. Same problem, different guts. Also, it grabbed their fancy cubes. I forget what those do, but I'm guessing they're able to do more than we thought. Zethrid is leading space pirates and is upset because the paladins made her girlfriend break up with her, so she's a problem now. Oh, whoop, never mind. Wrapping up loose ends, I guess. Jazz, that's all we're all. Whoop, never mind. She's gonna live. Everything needs to have a twist. Literally everything all the time, constantly. J There's fake out after fake out in this show. Here's Anerva's plan. She's planning on sucking away the quintessence life force from a whole galaxy. We don't know why, but she's going to create the biggest genocide in history. She literally rips open into other timelines, all multiverse style. I, I mean, I guess if I could find a more favorable time line, I would do that too. Or in her case, she brings back Lotor. She just really missed her deranged dead son, wanted to try raising him without being horribly corrupted by quintessence. Would your mom decimate civilizations and use creepy space magic to bring you back from the dead? No? Sounds like she's not a great mom, just saying. We're now getting to the point where nothing matters. If you can just undo someone's death, then what are the stakes? I get that we had the opportunity to destroy literal planets and on a realistic viewpoint, that's terrible, but for a story, it's just a flavor to make bringing characters back really cool. The moment you bring someone one back, you break a lot of potential tension you had with the audience. When you break your own rules, there are no rules, and what's even worse is that they keep whether or not Lotor comes back alive pretty nebulous. I'm not entirely sure if he's actually back or not. They decide to just leave. You know, that looks like bad news bears. Allura takes one of a nervous sycophants and sucks out one of those weird little bugs from the quintessence field. And then Lotor does some weird phantom form mind trick to talk to Allura without really being there. Or maybe it's Anerva, I don't know. And he explains to Allura that he still wants Anerva gone. She's still crazy, and that little bug she plants in her followers could be the key to beating her, saying it's a form of energy that predates time. And he basically tells Allura that she can become as powerful as Anerva. I mean, this is clearly a trap that Anerva is doing. And frankly, seeing how weak-willed Allura is, is insulting. Like, really? Would she really release that thing? This is the path of darkness. It is the path toward defeating Anerva. Okay, hold on. If this is gonna be a corruption arc, I'm all for it. It's been a long time since it was only the seven of us in a room together. Let's make sure it's not the last. Yikes. Oof. I have bad news for you, Keith. They use the space bug and Voltron to do some psychic togetherness magic in order to find where Anerva is through the power of, I don't know, man, hippie weirdo, everything is connected, man, sort of stuff. I, I'm not saying it's stupid. I'm just saying it's real. It's not easy to paraphrase. Oh yeah, Allura is getting a corruption arc. <laughs> God, I love corruption arcs. And it's different from just being corrupted because she chose it. Also, they do this trial where they fight against the previous souls of the older paladins. They free their souls. This is just weird. Is this another attempt at them sort of bringing back dead characters? I get that it's not the same, but seriously, things are coming out of left field. 
What's the purpose of this? Patting the paladins on the back? Reiterating everything we already know? I'm at a point where I can't tell if this is supposed to be a serious moment or a throwaway moment. Everything feels like it's supposed to be important constantly. Everything is supposed to be big, but when you make everything big, then they all just feel the same. There can't be climactic highs when it's all plateaued. I guess they just wanted Allura and her dad to see each other again. That's nice. I like Allura's character the most, but this feels... Eh. We are now focusing so much on magic, it doesn't feel like the same show. Sure, it makes sense. Altaians are magical. We're focusing on Altaians. Therefore, we gotta focus on some magic. But it's like ordering a burrito, biting into it, and it tastes like mac and cheese. Everyone loves mac and cheese, but our brain said, ooh, it gonna be a burrito, and it's gonna taste like a burrito, and then it doesn't. And even though we love mac and cheese, because our brain said burrito all the way, it's hard not to feel like it's gross. I'm describing cognitive dissonance. I just didn't want to beeline to saying cognitive dissonance. They try to give the soul of Zarkon a moment for a little bit of redemption, but oh my gosh, I just don't care. So they team up with the original paladins to break out of Anerva's mindscape, and it's supposed to be big and epic, and I'm kind of rolling my eyes. As we all knew, sucking a space bug that is psychically connected to Anerva would make Allura sick, because duh. Here's the thing I think is a massive problem with Voltron, or really Western animation in general. Comparing it to anime, anime has several story arcs. There's something new to go after, but with the same characters. With Voltron, it's one ongoing thing that just doesn't seem to stop, and eventually you can't help but feel like they should have just won by now. You come back seven seasons later and realize, you know, they're still trying to do the same thing. It gets stale. We love these characters, but it wears us down if they're just fiddling around with the same problem. This show became a war of attrition between its viewers. Allura doesn't stay sick long. We need to finish her off. I, I mean, her character arc. <laughs> Successfully fusing her and Lotor's mechs, Anerva uses her wing petals to tear open a portal, and she says, see you later, losers. Suddenly, the space whale that gives off a bunch of energy swoop in to help. Balmarin's giving space whale energy to the Atlas so they can traverse realities because we gotta make up rules as we go along for this to work. So the Atlas and Voltron fuse together into a slightly uglier robot. Anerva finds an alternate reality Zarkon, sane, intact, and healthy, and she meets him, a reality where Anerva wasn't there, and Zarkon welcomes her into his life. It's a life that she's always wanted. She's able to raise Lotor properly, but her perfect reality falls apart once Lotor sees her for who she really is. Lotor always knew that she's corrupted, and all her efforts are lost when Lotor doesn't accept her. Anerva can't hold it together, her facade of sanity was a lie, turning on the very thing she's always sought. Voltron comes through the rift of realities to stop her. In the end, she decides to destroy the universe. All universes. Listen. Okay. <clears throat> I talk about them making stuff up, but like everything makes sense. Anerva getting Lotor's ship because it has the Voltron crystal in order to traverse realities? Makes sense. The Atlas shape-shifting because it's got a little Voltron crystal in it? It makes sense. The motivations of the villains all line up. It's all well thought through. I'm not saying that's the problem. There isn't a stone unturned or an avenue left unexplored. Frankly, I need to give Voltron props for how tight-knit the writing is, but hopefully you can see that tight-knit writing doesn't necessarily make a good story. Funny enough, the last couple seasons were brought back to 13 episodes. The last couple seasons that really didn't need those extra episodes. They keep dragging things out to make it feel epic. Like, no, no, not yet. Hold it a little longer. Gotta keep that tension going. But if you're in a constant state of tension, eventually you just stop feeling the tension. Anerva literally goes to the core of the universe where each strand are their own realities. 
and now we're getting to a scope where everything is on a godly level. We've gotten to the point where Voltron should be a god by now, but they aren't. This feels so strange. It's so far outside the scope of what we initially wanted that now it's to the point of ridiculous. We keep trying to make the stakes bigger and bigger, and when you do that, your scope becomes so massive you can't see it anymore. They keep trying to make it to where all hope seems lost, backs are against the wall, but it's like that over and over and over. Heck, the Lions lost power so many times through this show, I lost count. Their backs are never against a wall, they just keep crashing through more and more walls. The walls are made of plywood. We're just some kids in a sandbox making up the most random epicness that we can think of. It's gone so far into the magical metaphysical side that nothing feels tangible. We've reached a point where everything is wrapped in its own metaphor that the metaphor is lost. And this isn't the fault of the shippers or the toxic fandom. This is the fault of pushing a story beyond its limits, desperately trying to maintain interest and not knowing when to let it end. Sometimes the moral thing to do is to let something die. And we're keeping Voltron on life support in a vegetative state and it's sad. Alora is the best character in this show. This whole story revolves around her. The Paladins were never main characters. The main character was always Alora. It was her people. It was her war. It was her species. Everyone else just stumbled into it. And now Alora is choosing to sacrifice herself to undo the damage that Anerva has done. Kissing Lance terms him part Altaian. Oh, that's so what? Okay. Space magic started all this and space magic fixes it all as well. We were so desperate for a touching and memorable ending that we really started reaching for it, overextending ourselves to force an ending that works. But now we get an end to the 10,000 year war. Woohoo! If only it felt like an actual victory. Now the universe doesn't need Voltron and the lions leave. Voltron had everything it needed to be one of the greatest animated series ever. And it's just a shame we watched a giant fall so hard. On paper, the plot was solid. I'm sure that ending was incredibly touching for some people. Joaquin Dos Santos apologized with how they handled the queer subplot, which they handled it badly, but I don't think it deserved the outrage that was hauled at them. When it came to addressing the complaints of the fans, the showrunners did the right thing. And by that, I mean they completely ignored them. Except for the one part where they decided to add LGBT representation and then screwed that up horribly a bit besides that. Some people thought killing Alora was racist because she was the only dark-skinned person in the group. Which, I mean, like, people think Shiro is white, and it's like, no, he's Japanese. His name is Shirogane. <laughs> and for some reason, people don't remember that. <laughs> and people will see Lance as, like, white passing, but with a tan, even though they specifically said in the show that he's Cuban. You maybe have an argument for her, for Allura being the only dark-skinned woman, but out of everything, the one thing that this show did really well was the diversity. In my opinion, I could be wrong. I'm, you know. I know Alora died in the end, and sure, that's probably insulting, but they made Alora the best character in the show. Just, you know, she didn't kill her off for just for shock value. She didn't die. She sacrificed herself. There is a difference. She was a hero. I feel like it's another example of the fans of Ultron ignoring what's directly in front of their face, but then again, this is coming from a white person, so I could be far off base. This doesn't directly affect me. So if I'm just horribly wrong and I'm missing something, then like seriously, I'm, I, need to be, I, I need to be educated on this. Tell me in the comments below. Moving on, they, the fans shouted at the showrunners for change, but the fans were in a different world entirely. In the end, the show got what it deserved a proper ending, no loose ends. Everything was tied up, everything was addressed, and we got a bittersweet bow on top. 
I would argue Voltron is still one of the best animated series out there, even with the problems that it has, which I think those problems will slowly be more and more forgiven all over time. Probably not all the problems. I don't think all the problems are gonna be forgiven over time. A lot of the reason why people perceived those problems as so horrendously massive was just because of public outcry. The opinions and whining of the toxic vocal minority that doesn't represent the Voltron fandom as a whole. Tell me what you thought of Voltron's ending. Did you think it fell short? Or do you think it ended just how you wanted it to? If you're someone who watched the whole show without interacting with the fandom at all, what was your experience? Subscribe for more deep dives. I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay beautiful and keep playing.